I had him on Hangout, uh, gosh, I guess it was like three years ago now, uh, when he came out with his book, Brilliant Blenders. Well, he's recently read another one called Galileo and the Science Deniers. And let me go ahead and bring up Brian so he can introduce himself and what we're going to talk about this week. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Great, Tony. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. yeah. I'm really looking forward to all these. I mean, everyone gets to see how shaggy I'm getting after uh, oh, you need to three do what months I did. of haircut. You need to do what I did. Get one of these coronavirus cuts, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> see, I, I, I got the got the trim. <laughs> that's nice. You've got uh, excellent uniformity and isotropy. Yeah, that's exactly. Yes, it's the same <laughs> everyone. Just like the expansion of the universe. It's like it's not growing uh, isotro that's as, right. isotropically. It's not inflating like my stomach. <laughs> yes, <laughs> good example. All right. So tell us what we're going to talk about this week. Today, we're going to talk with a mutual about a mutual friend, Mario Livio, who's uh, not only one of the uh, most celebrated uh, you know, astronomers and popularizers of science, but he's also Italian and a scholar, and he has a new book out, a wonderful new book. I've read all of his books, and uh, his book called uh, Galileo and the Science Deniers is out now, and uh, I had the honor to speak to him last Friday on the uh, weekend before his book was coming out and kind of got the inside scoop on a bunch of topics that I was always fascinated to learn about. You know, you've read my book, Losing the Nobel mm -hmm. Prize, and I have um, much to say about Galileo as a hero, but also as a human. And I think one of the most interesting parts of our discussion with Mario and me <clears throat> was um, was about Galileo as a, as a father, as a uh, ordinary person, as a subject, as a religious believer and someone grappling you know with these uh, twin kind of desires to understand the mind of god and also to understand the works of nature and and how that was done for the first time and uh, mario is as i said an italian he's an astronomer and this is the first biography ever written of galileo by an astronomer so it has insights that our audience our mutual audience will find unique for the first time yeah, well, um, I, we have a couple of clips that we can show for the interview itself, and you just tell me when you want me to play them. But um, I want to let people watching this know I put a link to the full interview in my in the description box of my video. And if you have not subscribed to Ryan's channel yet, you need to do that. And the link to that is also in the description box. That's what you'll and you you'll get notified every time he's doing it. I, but when we're done here, we're going to talk about. He has to leave exactly uh, in about twenty seven minutes. So we I want to because he's about to do another interview which we'll give you a preview of uh, before he leaves so um, all right so what shall we just start with one of the clips or do you want to give some more because I have some questions about Galileo <clears throat> in particular think, and what's in the book yeah let's let's uh, let's check out one of the clips but the the thing that I focused on primarily with Mario was uh, trying to be a little bit gently as a friend but a little slightly adversarial and asking the questions you know that I was hoping would provoke him into answering for the first time, you know, rather than saying, you're so brilliant, which I think he is, but instead of just talking about that, why not say, challenge him a little bit? So that was kind of my uh, my, my attempt here to really get him to, to open up about, you know, how bad is it really? I mean, this word denier is an uh, has awful connotations ranging, you know, from Holocaust denier to, to other uh, denying, uh, denying other sort of facts in history. So I wanted to, to kind of talk about that first, get a sense of why he named the book, what he did. So yeah, why don't we go ahead and roll that and then you can ask a question and then love answering questions from the audience. All right. So this will be the book, the one that's called Mario book trailer, the book. Trailer? Uh, yeah, okay. I think they're both called that, but yeah, I think we'll see which one this one is first. All right. Can you walk the audience through the choice of the cover design? We'll put up a picture of it. And, uh, and even the title of the book. Let's start there. Yeah, so, well, the title, uh, you see, this is a biography of Galileo, but because Galileo had to deal with uh, all kinds of science deniers, and because science denialism is, the way I see it, a big problem today, uh, then this is what determined the title, Galileo and the Science Deniers. Namely, it's a biography of Galileo, but with an eye on science denial today. So that's about the title. Uh, concerning the image uh, on the cover, uh, so I chose uh, the very first portrait of Galileo uh, when he was relatively young, probably in his 40s. It was done by an unknown Tuscan painter 
but it's the very first portrait known of him. Um, mm. Usually people, uh, you know, are familiar with pictures of him by Sustermans when he was old. Um, even there is one attributed to Tintoretto when he was sort of middle-aged. Uh, this one is, uh, is, is the earliest. So that's that. And then there are these, uh, uh, there is this figure of uh, orbits of planets uh, around the sun. And uh, the way the cover was chosen is that his picture is in the middle of that, which makes it look almost as if he is uh, uh, in the bullseye of a target, uh, which kind of describes his life. Okay, good. So, couple. So I've got I got several things I want to approach here. One is about Galileo and the story of Galileo, uh, and the other is about science denialism itself. And so, and and I, I'll ask you, Brian, these questions so that you can give me maybe answers in the context of the interview or what you know what kind of tease us a little bit about what's in the interview. But I'd also like your opinions on this. First of all, I think, and I I, I have learned and read quite a bit about the time in which Galileo lived and during the, the, you know, the, the very famous trial and all of that stuff that he went under, how accurately do you think we remember that time period uh, where Galileo was, was promoting the ideas of Copernicus? Yeah, so the main controversy that he was teaching uh, was uh, essentially whether or not the Earth was the center of the universe. And uh, for reasons, you know, Mario's not a biblical scholar. I'm not a biblical scholar, but I, I can read uh, ancient Hebrew and I understand uh, some of the distinction in there. What struck me is that the, uh, it's interesting to note, and I don't think people have really mentioned this, that there's nowhere in the Hebrew Old Testament that makes a claim that the earth is the center of the universe. There's one paragraph that seems to suggest that Joshua stopped the sun, which seems to mean that the sun is moving around the earth. Uh, instead of the other way around. But anyway, uh, be that as it may, um, the church was certainly against the Aristotelian model, the Ptolemaic model that the earth um, was going around the sun because in their mind, uh, things that were close to the center uh, were of the highest value. And uh, you see this in Dante's Inferno and other things that, that Galileo also lectured on. The controversy was uh, really, uh, you know, uh, elevated to this to this stage of lore, and there are books written that basically paint a very different portrait from Galileo's. Um, and I'll try to put a link to that in my uh, video at some point. But there, you know, that it was sort of overblown. And and one element of that that I challenged Mario on in the interview was, uh, you know, he was allowed to teach, or he was allowed to study the Copernican universe, even by the Church, even by the man who later became the Pope as long as he didn't teach it. And that distinction was crucial because in the Sidereus Nuncius, that, those words are Latin, and that means starry messenger in Latin, but he wasn't allowed to teach in Italian. And he found that out in 1616, and the Dialogo, the dialogue which really promotes Copernicanism, wasn't published until 1632. So, uh, so he had 16 years. Uh, he wasn't, you know, denied any freedoms. He wasn't uh, edited and censored in the way that we normally think. But uh, Mario goes through this wonderful discussion of the books between the Sidereus Nuncius and the Dialogo, and how this is part of a canon that Galileo was really intent on on settling Copernicanism once and for all. And the ironic thing is that none of his discoveries really proved that the Earth was going around the Sun. Uh, they just merely, quote unquote, I mean, he made he's my hero, so I'm saying this again. I'm, I try to be provocative. I try to take the Pope's side in things. Ironic for someone who's Jewish, uh, by the way. <laughs> uh, to take, and I, I, I keep pointing out that, you know, I keep I keep saying I'm the devil's advocate, but I'm really the Pope's advocate, you know, just gently, because I think interviews like that are more fun. So I took the Pope's side, and your listeners can let me know if I did a good job or not. Yeah, and uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because it's there's a lot of uh, I my wife I I learned a lot about this after I married my wife who is a not only a Catholic but a, and a theologian but a philosopher and she oh, wow. uh, taught me a lot about this history and about what the Catholic Church and the role of the Catholic Church in our scientific history which is actually quite extensive and you're yeah. absolutely right and and if Mario mentions this in the book so is he is all the, this idea that Galileo the only that they had, you know, the Pope and the Catholic Church had no problem with what he was doing. What they just didn't want him to do was to try and interpret it in terms of the Bible. What does this all mean? Because yeah. at the time, 
time, the church was under a lot of pressure because they had the Reformation going on. They were fighting for their survival. They just wanted Galileo to stop, right? And just not, yeah. you know. Not yeah. proselytize for that's this. A, that's right. And he was deeply religious himself. That's and you know what's right. so interesting? That's right. You go through and you read the book and you find out Mario's quoting all these Jesuit astronomers. That's right. You're like, well, if they were really anti-science the way that some people are, you know, in some sense, uh, why were they employing astronomers, you know, affected, not astrologers, actual astronomers who were tracking movements of things in the heavens for specific scientific purposes, as I always say, you know, if you do, I, I never try to convert people. I never try to make a case for for any type of religious practice or secularism whatsoever. But if you are religious, if you have religious inclinations, I'm sure your wife uh, has discussed this with you many times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's no kind of more interesting angle than to that. I basically think all theologians should be scientists. Not to say that they're you know not doing a good job if they don't, but if they ignore science, they're really ignoring a possible dimension that could you know complement things that that uh, are of interest to them. So I, I feel like the tension usually it's put as science is being suppressed by religion, but I actually think it's it's because religious people aren't as interested in science as they could be or should be. Yeah, I mean it's been true since the beginning, and I'm talking again about Catholics because I know what that's what I know the most about. Yeah. Um, that you know, that whenever scientific evidence has come to light, uh, they have not been in denial of it, and 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 I think even Neil deGrasse Tyson said this once, where periodically the Catholic Church has gone back and reinterpreted the Bible in light of new evidence. They've never done that because it wasn't it's not their job. Uh, right. to to do that. And so they never they haven't said, well, the Bible needs to be now interpreted in light of this new evidence as the following thing, uh, because they realize that a lot of this, these stories and the sources of the stories and the purpose for which these stories were written, the audience for which these stories are for uh, does not always coincide with the scientific evidence out there. And so that's right. Uh, it's it's they, there really isn't. And I've made this and I'll talk about this more guys after because while Brian's here, I want to use Brian, but about my own opinions on this. But the, the there is not a war, uh, in my opinion, between science and religion. And there really never has been. Um, but you know, that's I'll, I'll talk more about that when I uh, a little bit later on. So okay, let well, so he presents in the, in the book a, a, a picture of Galileo, his life, the way in which he lived. There's been a lot of biographies yeah. on Galileo. But it sounds to me like the interesting part of this book, at least to me, is this connection between Galileo's time and the denial of science. So how does he make that yeah. connection? Yeah, I think those uh, that element's really interesting. And I think the deep astronomy and into the impossible audiences will find the astronomical perspective that Mario brings as a prominent astronomer. Uh, to to light, no pun intended, that he has a different dimension into this book. Just as a historian, um, you know, of of Middle or you know Renaissance art will have a different perspective than a modern artist on, say, Michelangelo or, or Leonardo da Vinci, whatever. So um, so that makes this book very interesting to people like me. But the history and the kind of uh, obviously the the catchy, provocative title that it uses. Um, really set 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 things in motion for me wanting to really get into it with Mario. And, and so I asked him questions, you know, in what sense was he really punished for his beliefs? In other words, if you look at what happened to him, he was forbidden to do something. He not only did what he was forbidden to do, again, I'm taking devil's advocate, Pope's advocate. Mm -hmm. uh, he not only did it, he taught it in Italian, which was basically you know, proselytizing a message of that the church didn't had forbidden him to uh, to speak, but uh, finally he also was you know kind of so in love with the theory that he uh, that he really kind of presented evidence that isn't fitting. In other words, he was sort of suffering from confirmation bias that you and I talk about quite frequently, <laughs> and it runs the gamut from you know uh, going to to the links of of being punished by the Vatican. Now, what happened to him? His punishment. I said it's. I think Bertie Madoff would trade. Uh, trade punish you know prison cells with Galileo in a heartbeat because actually part of the interview uh, I have in my Zoom background pictures that I took in 2015 from Galileo's in, imprisoned villa where he spent the last eight years of his life and uh, Tony I got to tell you if I ever you know have to be imprisoned by the NSF or my funding agencies <laughs> do or whatever they do that? I, I hope it'll be there NSF uh, because. <laughs> 
I already would have been, I, I suppose, you know, because of all the blunders I've made in my life. But um, but this is a sumptuous villa with grape, uh, you know, figs and and olive orchard, and uh, it was it was not far from. It was about a kilometer. You can see the nun convent where his daughter, one of his daughters, Maria, Maria Celeste, was uh, was a nun because she was uh, illegitimate, and back then it was very difficult for w women that didn't have legitimate parents. So he was not only permitted to live in a pretty sumptuous villa, he was living near his daughter. So what kind of, you know, oppression and and uh, and, and suppression was this? Now, he had to, it's true, he, he did have to bend down his knee in front of the Pope, uh, you know, but it wasn't like there was Twitter and paparazzi and, uh, and, and that, you know, there are paintings that survive. And even from that, uh, that epoch, even from that, uh, from that situation, where he was forced to bow down and recant that the earth uh, is this uh, goes around the sun, uh, allegedly Mario debunks this myth or or puts test to the myth, uh, perhaps myth that Galileo actually said under his breath, "It still moves, uh, even despite what the Pope is commanding me to say." In other words, he muttered under his breath, "It said, uh, uh, the earth still moves." And so Mario has a piece in Scientific American that I'll uh, link folks to in the podcast as well uh, that he did with Steve Mursky. And he talks a little bit about how he came to um, challenge this myth uh, and, and confront it with facts uh, throughout history. So I think those kinds of things paint a portrait of Galileo as a human being, as a man, not just uh, not just the you know true uh, truth seeker at all costs who is punished and tortured for science. That's that's sort of mythological. There's yeah. actually a book called. Uh, uh, tortured uh, by science or Galileo on trial, one of these. And, and again, it's it's sort of debunking the myth that he was a martyr for science. He was a great man. He was treated unfairly. Uh, his message resounds more than ever. But uh, he was, you know, he was no saint. He was not perfect because like you and me, he was a man. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, would, would, um, would you say that the getting back to the concept of denying science or at least I, I don't know that it's fair to even say that there was a lot of denial of science going on. Well, I, mean, I guess there was, sure, in, in, in Galileo's time. Do you think there's much difference between what happens, in, but what's happened several hundred years ago and today with respect to denying science? And why do you think it's so prevalent now? Or is it really prevalent? And we've got some kind of bias because we're scientists. I think, I think the latter. I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you know, you see things through this lens of science and the perspective is, oh, yeah, it's very harsh. I think, you know, the, he had a book review in Nature, which was mostly positive about this book, but it also cited a concern that I had. You know, really, the only science that he claims is being denied is global warming <clears throat> in this book, uh, uh, modern science, ex uh, by, say, uh, um, uh, an organization, an entity uh, <clears throat> that... Um, and in other words, there's there is uh, say uh, denial of evolution, say, um, but that's not you know the 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 country's policy or enacted upon some treaty that we withdraw from or something in the way that global warming is or climate change. So I think uh, the examples were kind of thin, and you know he he wants to guard against the you know kind of theocracy or autocracy. But really, the main message he had was was about um, in the book was about climate change denialism, and then secondly, there was another uh, you know thing that he brought up just because of the time in which the book is being released, not when it was written about COVID nineteen and and how we should listen to scientists, and so we debate that a little bit because not all the models and not all the you know the scientists have uh, have uh, the exact same thing to say. And I actually made the point, you know, not to give myself too much credit, but I did make the point that like, look. What Einstein, was he a science denier? I mean, he didn't believe the universe was expanding. He vehemently opposed it. He called Lemaitre's theory of the primeval atom, which later became called the Big Bang, he called that an atrocious misapplication of his theory until he was shown evidence to the contrary. Now, you know, you're a pope back in the 1600s. What are you? What is your job? Is it to like make, be the final arbiter of scientific truth? Um, uh, I don't, I don't think so. I think, you know, there, I, I, again, I put on my devil's Pope advocate hat and said, well, if there was some asteroid coming to the earth, what would be your role as, as kind of King or monarch of the planet? Would it be to tell everybody the truth that they're about to die or would it be to keep peace? And I, I, I want people to listen to his answer and see if it convinces them. Yeah. The, uh, 
there's a lot of, to me, science denialism, um, okay, you brought up the idea of Einstein and, you know, he didn't like certain ideas, certain, certain scientific theories, uh, but he had good reasons for not liking those things. And, you know, in, in many cases, this idea of quantum mechanics, he also didn't like, but, you know, he's, he, he didn't act in bad faith. And to me, that's where a lot of the denialism of today comes from. It's just a, a, a willful, uh, a willful ignorance that they don't, that there isn't a good faith attempt to look at the facts. There's just this flat out denialism that's going on, uh, in the face of, you know, obvious, ob you know, observations. You can debate the, the, some of the details, like whether the models are going to be, you know, plus or minus 20% or whatever they're going to be. But it's the idea of even the basic, uh, methods of science are being denied and even, you know, uh, uh, not trusted. And that's to me dangerous, right? Especially mm -hmm. today, uh, with, with not just the coronavirus, but also, you know, just about everything else, you know, our, our existence is going to be threatened by this inability to accept our observations about the world and this lack of trust that goes on. And I think there's probably good reasons for people to not trust authority and not trust, uh, uh science, but, at some point, you've got to have a good faith effort uh, at looking at the facts around you. And just instead of just being just throwing your hands up and say, well, nothing anybody says in the scientific world I'm ever going to listen to. And right. I don't know and if it was like that in Galileo's time, but it sure, it sure seems that way today. Yeah, I think so. I think there's this mythology that we cultivate that we're these walking Wikipedias and we are infallible, uh, at least in the public mind. Oh, trust science. And, you know, I heard it pointed out that like it took, you know, it took nuclear physicists working on the Manhattan Project to develop the bomb, but they didn't go around and say, oh, um, you know, Richard Feynman, you helped develop the bomb. Uh, should we drop it? I mean, he's a very brilliant man. But uh, a politician, Harry Truman, this made that decision. Now you can argue with who's in politics now, and that's why we live in a, in a democracy. I felt, to be honest with you, I love Mario, but I felt the examples could have been beefed up a little bit. I see people in the chat asking about UFO science. I agree, you can deny it, you can refute different facts that are claimed about the universe, that the universe, that the earth is flat. You can refute that with facts, but there's no policy that's coming down next week, or maybe the week after, we'll talk about Sarah Scholes' book about UFOs and this whole culture fueled by billion dollars, billionaires and millionaires, uh, and uh, you know, funding this search for UFOs and and really popularizing it. And that's a little bit more invidious because it's getting into you know front page articles in the New York Times month after month. You know, this is happening and and re releases without any contravailing evidence whatsoever. There's great work being done to debunk these videos that are coming out from fighter pilots. Again, so, you know, a pilot, a pilot's very good. He or she is a great skill and it's very hard to master it. Uh, but, you know, can they interpret uh, optical phenomena? Do they know about illusions? Do they know about signal to noise ratios and beam patterns, interference, uh, things in the infrared spectrum, angular resolution? No, of course not. And we don't want them to. I want them to be good pilots. Right. Similar. I want scientists to be good scientists, not be responsible for making all the policy decisions in the world. I think one look at my department or, you know, a, a physics department anywhere will tell you that, you know, scientists aren't the best politicians. No, no, they're not even the best <laughs> communicators. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of, but they're good at, at, you know, interpreting nature and that's what we want them to be good at. And exactly. it's the other people's job, like you and I, to discuss and communicate their science. Uh, That's right. Out there. So we don't need them to do that. But um, OK, quick question. I just want to ask you about before we started, I saw a comment. And I'm sorry, I don't remember who made it. I tried to scroll up and didn't see it. This idea of um, flat earthers, would mm -hmm. you consider them uh, science deniers? Well, or something you know, else? I I think that that, uh, you know, I would consider them just ignorant. I wouldn't say that they deny science any more than, you know, if you use a map to get around your city in Florida or here in San Diego, I, uh, I, the world sure looks flat. But if you look at it from that perspective, you know, I can put my hand in front of my face and say, oh, you know, nothing is possible to be in, in, uh, seen stereoscopically. Oh, but you have a better perspective. Right. So I think it's the lack of inquisitiveness to actually follow evidence. Now, if they deny rationality. If you show them evidence, you show them different ways to prove, uh, and it's very simple to do so, uh, you can you can easily prove that. Now, on the other hand, and that's why the church didn't deny that the earth is, is spherical, 
you know, roughly spherical. Although there's a great quote, you know, from Isaac Asimov, who says, you know, if you believe the Earth is uh, is round, you're wrong uh, because it's not perfectly round. But if you believe it's not a perfect sphere, it has some distortion. But if you believe the Earth is flat, you're also wrong, and you're much wrong in a much worse fashion. <laughs> you're much right. more egregiously wrong. And I think if you believe something without evidence or in the face of counterfactual evidence, then you can maybe be elevated to the class of denialism. If you believe stuff like, you know, the moon landing didn't happen. Uh, there's differences between, you know, believing in conspiracies or that UFOs are here. Um, and that colors a little bit more with political leanings and so yeah. forth. So I don't necessarily think that I actually made a joke yesterday or two days ago that although the um, the earth is not flat, the whole universe is known to be flat. That's so, right. That's exactly right. <laughs> take, uh, take comfort in that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a good that's a good distinction. And I and I guess. Uh, for me, with when it comes to thinking about the, the the flat Earth, you know, people and the and the ones that are um, denying other parts of of science, it has to. It's more of a trust issue. Um, it's this 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 sort of a they just something about authority that they're just not willing to buy, and they feel like they're being a, a sold a bill of goods by not only the scientific community, but in their in their leaders and everything else. These same people will will go out and and have problems with other parts of science as well, not just whether the earth is flat or not. And they seem to want, but, but on the other hand, they also, I, the ones that I've seen that they're being honest in their investigation of the flat earth actually try to employ some pretty good scientific methods. Yeah. Uh, they're flawed, but at least they're mm -hmm. trying to think of it in a way that proves it to them that the earth is flat. Um, and so, I mean, one example was in a, during an eclipse, you, you, it, they tried to recreate the shadow going in the opposite way. Cause it goes the opposite mm -hmm. way from West to East, uh, when during an eclipse. And so they were trying to even make the, the disc of the moon smaller than the earth. And they couldn't do it, uh, mm -hmm. properly because they were using an extended light source. And so they, they would use a flashlight on a tennis ball on it. And of course the, the cone gets really big and you, when you shine right. it on a wall, had they used a point source, they would have seen, you know, that this, uh, would have been a little bit better. It would have actually gone to the shadows would have worked right. So I don't know. I mean, they try to do it, but yeah, if you're, if you're doing you know. it in earnest, look uh, again, Galileo didn't prove that the earth goes around the sun. In fact, that wasn't proven nope. uh, until the 17 or 1800s when we could do measurements of what's called stellar aberration. So That's if you right. really want to, annoy a scientist. I, I was talking to a PhD yesterday. I said, prove to me that the uh, sun is uh, the center of the solar system. And that, he had to think for a long time before he could actually come up with some ideas to prove it without using a rocket ship and you know, just prove right. it to me here on earth. It's Coper very hard to do. Yes. Copernicus was wrong when he died. Galileo was <laughs> wrong when he died. Newton was wrong when he died. These are, right. but, but, but you know, they still contributed a lot towards science Absolutely, and, who, right. and so far, Einstein's been right about everything, but it, you know who knows where we'll go with this. Okay, we're almost out of time. What's next week? What do you? What? Oh, let's talk about your next interview so people can get a test, a taste of what you're about. Oh yeah, to leave well, I'm going to be interviewing in my controversial cosmology sem series seminar and these episodes that I'm calling Pandemic Podcasts. Uh, I'm going to be recording with Eric Weinstein of, of nice. famous Teal Capital. Uh, geometric Unity is his new model of the universe. Uh, I want to talk to him about that. Uh, one, it'll be the first time he's talking to a physicist, an actual a living, breathing physicist, and a, instead of Joe Rogan, who's I don't believe a physicist, uh, although who knows? <laughs> but he, he plays one on TV. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he might be a theoretical uh, physicist. I don't, yeah. I'm just a humble experimentalist. Right. And then, uh, but maybe next week we'll talk about yeah, Sarah Scholes's book uh, called "They Are Already Here." And yesterday I recorded an episode that's coming out in my channel on Sunday for Mother's Day with Sasha Sagan, who is Good. Carl Sagan and Andrewian's daughter. And I want to talk about that. Uh, we could talk about that next week. We could talk about the Sarah Skulls book. Uh, we have a lot of really good interviews coming up. Uh, this is on the Arthur C. Clarke Center's Into the Impossible podcast. And on my YouTube channel, you can um, subscribe to both, please, because actually we, we do different things. The video ones, we give away, uh, we don't give away anything. And the audio ones, we give away a copy of the book, at least once our local bookstore opens up here, we will give away a copy of the book. Um, and uh, and then hopefully people will uh, enter to win that. And then on the video on the YouTube channel, I give away um, 
uh, uh, well, I don't give away. We, we do interviews and we add in graphics, links, show notes, exercises for the reader. So I think it's, uh, it's kind of fun. I'm having a lot of fun in this lockdown period. Actually, Dude, you, yeah, you're making some great content. And so, uh, I would encourage everybody to get on your channel and subscribe to these podcasts because these are great people to be discussing all of this with. Um, and, and, and recently you've done, we talked about this briefly, uh, Freeman Dyson, who has recently passed away is now also somebody you were able to talk to. So uh, a lot of great people. So definitely yeah. check them out guys. Um, all right. Yeah. So next week we'll, we'll be back next time on the 21st. I'll just warn everybody. I think I've got a double AS, um, uh, hangout planned, uh, in two weeks, but next week we'll be here. So, uh, we'll, we'll be back with Brian and we'll talk about some more cool stuff. So thanks Brian. I know you got to go. So just go ahead and, and hang up. Thanks Tony. I'll here. hang up now, but All you right. have a great day. And All right. Yeah. So I will, uh, I'll hang around for a little bit longer and talk to you guys. Um, Hey face roller. Yeah. He's, he's a teacher at UCSD is a professor there. Uh, let's see. Uh, so let me look at some of your, I've been, I, I was so, because he had a hard cutoff. He had to get to, I didn't read a lot of your chat. So let me do that now. Hey, Andrew, it's good to see you again. Varun Vega on Twitch. It's good to see you as well. Um, and uh, better and better. It looks like you're everywhere, man. You're both on Twitch and uh, YouTube. By the way, I am streaming on all the things except for Instagram. I'm not streaming on that, but um, so I'm everywhere always. Um so let's see here. Andrew Planet. Science denial is an artifactual expression of our species of adaptations for social order based on physical aggression aided and embedded by gaslighting. <laughs> I, love, I love it, man. That's awesome. <laughs> UFO science is denied. No, actually, you know, people, there are, there are actual unidentified flying objects. What, so people do study what these things are, but what, the connection between something that's unidentified in the air and a, an alien, that, that connection is, is probably not science. Um, uh, Galileo's dream is a good book by Ken Stanley Robbins. That's a good one, Simon. I like that. Um, yes, that's right, John. He could still entertain guests and even go out into his garden where he could watch apples falling <laughs> and totally fail to get the hint. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> that's great. Um, I do believe in God, but not in a specific one, just someone who created. Okay, that's good. Um, and Architufus is commenting, they're the ones responsible for building schools back in the colonialism era. I think you must be talking about Catholics. Uh, and also, I wanted to thank Hans Milling for the super chat. Thank you, man. Yes, it will go towards my new camera. Uh, this uh, I'm using an old uh, Logitech camera right now. As you can no doubt tell, it's uh, not the best quality but it is getting the job done. So, yeah. Um, so thank you, Hans. I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the support. Humans are egotistical and narcissistic, says Varun Vega. And I, they certainly are self-centered. That's for sure. Um, it's hard to, uh, I like to think they're more empathic than they are, but, um, uh, I don't know. Um, let's see. Uh, the earth is flat. Evolution is only a theory. COVID is just a flu. That's from Architufus. And you were almost banned, dude, <laughs> for saying that. Um, okay. So I think, um, let's see, Simon's going, I'm trying to say this with the most, the most respect as possible, but I really appreciate Dr. Keating's transformation and communication style from his SETI Institute lecture days. Um, good. I guess, uh, you weren't happy with those days. Um, but you know, as he, as he will point out, you know, he, we're all evolving. We're all growing a little bit. And, and certainly I've made a lot of blunders and on streaming online or, or talking and giving talks. So, uh, Tony switch Thursdays. That's right. Um, so yes, it's been, um, you know, thank, I, I enjoy talking with him and he gets access to uh, a lot of really great, um, people and he's promised that he's going to connect me with some of them so i wouldn't mind talking to eric for a while and i might get mario back i have no problem with really just like bearing down on people and trying to get them to say you know stuff that they might not ordinarily say but um let me just point out i want to point out something to you guys this is uh you know when talking about galileo let me see if i can get this switched over um what is that? That I'm going to push some buttons here for just a minute. Yeah, here we are. 
Okay, here is a picture, uh, a very famous picture that was that was painted um, depicting the Inquisition of Galileo. And here, I hope you can see. Yes, good. My my cursor is here. Here's a you know, there's a lot of symbolism here. You have Galileo standing defiantly here off to the right with a with a almost a halo around him, uh, around his head, the arbiter of science. And then standing here is a, you know, with their backs literally against the wall, <laughs> uh, are the, is the Catholic church, uh, you know, trying to, uh, argue and, and fight with him, um, about his beliefs and ideas. But one of the, you know, this to me is one of the first examples of the myth of Galileo being this big, you know, arbiter of, um, you know, defier of the church, um, in the sense that he was trying to, you know, just, uh, say things that, 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 that put the church at, um, on the defensive and he was doing those things, but this was painted. If I scroll down here, 1857, this was several hundred years after the actual events took place. And so, um, the, there's the and this is sort of one of the uh, examples of this what I think is another myth of this war a so-called war between science and religion. Um, early on, uh, the church, uh, the Catholic Church, had been very involved in our scientific progress. In fact, they were the only ones in the Western world, at least progressing things uh, as early as I think it was Bede the Venerable uh, was like in the uh, was like in 400 um, I, I'm getting my dates very but very close to uh, uh, 400 AD or so not too long after Constantine switched to Catholicism um, and he was one of the first to re to to uh, write theories about the earth being round uh, picking up on the Greeks again uh, and their and their work and then we've got um, uh, there's and all the way up through Newton's time, where uh, Isaac Newton was um, an extremely uh, religious or, uh, religious person. In fact, he wrote more science or uh, religious papers than he did scientific papers. And uh, so he was, uh, you know, he he always looked at himself as a religious person first and foremost. So there is room for both. Is is the point I'm trying to make? I am personally an atheist, but you know, I. I respect the history and I want to look at it with honesty of what has happened in the past with, uh, with religion. So um, I think that we too often take these myths and we distort them in ways that are unhealthy. And I think they also breed a lot of the mistrust that we see in the science denialism of today. Uh, if people would just, and, and scientists don't help their case any. Uh, they that we have very prominent scientists uh, out there. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's done it. Bill Nye's done it. Um, although he's not a scientist, he's a communicator. Uh, and we've and and uh, Richard Dawkins at all doing some ra doing some rather intense damage um, to the scientific cause by uh, just just being belligerent towards people of faith. And so. I don't think that it helps, and I don't, and I, and and I don't think that that is a. It's an honest approach. I think it's just a a way of uh, uh, getting science, trying to shove science down people's throats in ways that are inappropriate. And so I feel I feel very strongly about this idea that you know there is not a war between science and religion. Uh, it's, at least there hasn't been in the past. And so with all of this scientism, scientism that's been attacking religion and religion uh, fights back with its, uh, with its trying to be more scientific, using scientific arguments uh, in their, to justify their faith, I think that's also a mistake, right? We have, you know, the creationism is a prime example of that, where we have uh, examples of museums where you can go to and and see, you know, this uh, these sort of dubious depictions of human beings uh, alongside dinosaurs and this idea that the earth really is only 6,000 years old. Uh, the literalism of the Bible is, I think, a dishonest uh, portrayal of what the faith is trying to communicate. And so it's been distorted on both sides, but it's also, I think, science doesn't have any real business making these uh, comments about things that aren't scientific, and that's the kinds of things that the scientific people of today are doing. I think, and I think it's a, dis I think it's a disservice. So I don't know. What do you guys think? Um, uh, 
uh, it's, um, I know that, I know that there are, you know, a lot of high emotions on this topic. Um, I am, I am not a, um, militant atheist. I think, and I think people that are, uh, really wreak a lot of havoc, uh, in the world, uh, by just being so militant about everything and, and trying to insert themselves, uh, insert science in places where it doesn't belong. So, um, and these ideas where, you know, of Galileo being, you know, at, at odds with the church, I think we've all sort of learned now it wasn't quite like that. His prisons were his, his, his you know, he was, he was a little bit belligerent. He was also part of the problem. <laughs> so he was, you know, he was, he's also very plagiaristic. He took a lot of people's ideas and made them, uh, as if they were his own. He would, he would teach them as if they were his own. So he was a, he was part of the problem uh, in that sense as well. And things could have gone a lot differently for Galileo had he, um, maybe shown, um, a little more respect for what he, you know, what he was trying to teach at the time. And, uh, if he had just, you know, the Pope, as we've recently learned, he just said, look, we support what you're doing. The work is valid just stop interpreting it in terms of the Bible. Just stop doing that. And, and that's the job of the church. The Bible is the part is the job of the church and let us, let us handle that. And you handle the science and we'll be fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. So, um, uh, so there is no proof for good. If there is good, uh, he wants you to believe, not know. Um, I think you mean God, but, uh, I'm a factualist, but I'm not an atheist. Is that's sort of a, a puffatism? Um, and Chris, uh, Chris goes. I'm sorry, Tony. I disagree. The likes of Christopher Hitchens, Dawkins, and Krauss are around 90 percent of the rest of the world. Uh, is just seen as common sense. It's only America that makes that takes offense. Um, well, okay. Um, so if I've read all of Richard Dawkins books and, and a couple of Christopher Hitchens books, and while I can't cite examples off the top of my head, cause I don't have that kind of memory anymore. Um, I can tell you that they are, they are making claims in their books that have to do with, uh, you know, science disproving God or, you know, this, you know, that, that, that the, uh, the view of science is the only right view that there is, and that it is the only view of the universe that will ever make sense. And that is where they do uh, humanity and knowledge in general, a great disservice, because that's just not true. Uh, there are other forms of knowledge that can be gained with outside of the realm of science. And so what they, what they tend to do is get away from the boundary of where science works. What is science? Science is our way of understanding the mechanics and the workings of nature. And if it stays in that realm, it does a very, very good job. And the technology that flies out of doing that science is extremely successful. So there's no, there's no question of the success of science in, in the quality of our lives and in the advancement of our technology. But an argument can be made that the scientific progress that we have enjoyed over these past 500 or some odd years, however long it is, um, has come at the expense of some other levels of knowledge that we, that we are kind of losing touch with. So to give an example, um, why are, you know, some very fundamental questions that are important to each and every one of us. Uh, are outside of the realm of science. An example would be, why do I love my wife? Uh, these are these are very <laughs> basic and but highly important questions. Well, I don't have a scientific answer. I could go down to the biological hormonal level and explain why my hormones are reacting the way they are and why I, why my, my brain synapses and how they are operating to produce this thing called love. But it doesn't tell me what love is. It falls far short of that. So I am gaining other knowledge about the world and experience about the world in ways that, uh, that are outside of the world of science. Another example would be, um, you know, morality. Are there absolute more? Is there an absolute right and wrong to the universe or is everything relative? Um, these are things that science 
isn't going to be able to put a, an experiment on and give you an answer for these things. And yet they are incredibly important sources of information. Why we do what we do. You know, why is murder wrong? Or is it really wrong, right? It affects our lives, and it is a very important part of who we are, and yet science is not a part of it, okay? Sure, we can give profiles of murderers and, and, and serial killers, and we can say, oh, you know, the reason this person is doing it is because he's got some kind of narcissistic personality disorder, and he doesn't have any empathy um, biologically, and so he murders people. But is that really the, the whole answer? And so it's, I think we lose sight of the other areas in life where science really doesn't have a lot to say but, uh, and can't really contribute. And yet these people like Hitchens and, and whom, whom I respect, okay? I mean, these are people I've read. I, I buy their books and I, and I listen to their arguments. I just think their arguments are unconvincing because they are being, first of all, belligerent and to the point of just making themselves sound famous or be famous and to be um, and to be somewhat um, argumentative about the topic, which is fine. That's okay. They just want their personality out there, which is, you know, part of what makes people famous. But they're also, I think, um, disingenuous in this, in, in this insertion of science in places that it really, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins has tried, I think, and it's certainly in the, I think it was in the selfish gene where he tried to uh, invoke uh, scientific reasons for why, you know, we behave the way we do, uh, you know, with, with respect to morality. But um, I, don't, I, I found them very unconvincing. So um, I would recommend a book to you that I found very good. Uh, it was called Monopolizing Knowledge, and it's written by a physicist at MIT who is a devout Catholic. Uh, and his name is Ian Hutchison. And that book, more than any other I've read, gives the arguments about why scientism does harm. And, and people like Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris, these are all scientistic people. They aren't scientists. They, are, they believe in scientism, which is this belief that everything in the universe can be framed in the world of science and the, in, the, in, the, in the words of science and, with, and it can be discovered with the methods of science. And, um, and so I would encourage you to read that book. Uh, if, you, if you go to my Amazon page, I have a link to it on there, but you'll find it. It's, it's available on Kindle and on Amazon and all that kind of stuff. And it's called Monopolizing Knowledge. Uh, and it's you know written by you know a, pla a a particle physicist or maybe he's a plasma physicist I forget anyway at MIT he's not just some um, he's a he's a working practicing uh, scientist and so he does a good job I think of framing the problem a lot better than I just did so um, uh, <sighs> there are no absolutes is an absolute statement that contradicts itself right so. Um, Yes, and and you know there there's lots of uh, arguments like that that end up just being self-contradictory, and I think a lot of the uh, atheists that we see out there um, are being self-contradictory, and they're trying to just own the religious people. <laughs> that's the goal, right? Let's own them because that's what we do now. We own the other side, whatever the other side is. We just want to own it, and that is such a counterproductive way to behave. That, you know, what do you possibly expect to gain from owning the flat earthers? Are you ever going to win that argument? First of all, it's a hopeless, hopeless cause. They don't, they aren't going to be convinced because they're not believing in a flat earth for reasons that have anything to do with rationality. They are believing in a flat earth. This is my theory uh, that uh, because they are part of a community of people of which they are a valued member. And we all want to be a part of a valuable community. Science or the mainstream, whatever has rejected them in whatever way. And they've, and they found a home among people who believe these weird things, but they are accepted and they are trusted and they are welcomed in. That's why they're flat earthers. They're not flat earthers because they really want this, this, you know, they want, they don't, they think that the earth is actually flat. They do, but that's, that's not the real reason why they're there. Because if you somehow could convince them rationally with a beautiful proof that the earth is in fact round, of course, we have all this proof uh, to, to give them and they get, you know, you're right. You're right. 
the earth is round. I have been wrong. What is the consequence of that admission? They are going to be ostracized from a community that they already feel a very important part of. They will be ostracized from their friends. And suddenly their life has changed. They've got a lot invested in this idea that the earth is flat. And the same, you know, the, the same is true for a lot of, you know, uh, uh, oh, I had the example and it, and it went away. Um, I, I don't want to say cult, but a lot of people who were in these cults, they are in them because of the acceptance level. And they aren't, they aren't interested in a rational argument for why, uh, why things are the way they are. That's not, you're not going to convince them ever. So why do it? You know, why get in the people's face? Uh, and just be belligerent. Are you doing yourself or your cause any good? Has anything ever changed from all the books that Richard Dawkins has written or that that Christopher Hitchens has has done? Has there been any real change? Has he changed any minds? And what's the point of doing it other than riling up your own side? And yeah, go ahead, rile up rile up your side. Get get really mad at all the religious people and just own the hell out of them. And then what? What are you going to do with all that anger, right? Have you done any real, made any real progress here? So if I, 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 I don't get it. I mean, I, I understand why people are angry and upset at people who won't believe in certain parts of science. I get that. It's annoying. It's, it's highly aggravating. And I would argue it's also dangerous, especially when you've got things like a pandemic to deal with. It's, if we do develop a vaccine, do you honestly think I mean, there was some, somebody had told me, I think it was a, a, a survey had been done where 30% of Americans won't take it. If a vaccine for the uh, COVID-19 uh, in, uh, uh, coronavirus is developed, 30% of, the, of, the, of Americans won't take it because they don't trust anything scientists say. And why don't they trust it? It's because of these books. God is not great. The selfish gene, the God delusion, you know, uh, the end of faith. These are all books that preach to a choir that goes then out and causes a lot of damage. And so that's my, that's my thinking on it. And I know that I, I've just pissed off 90% of you, but I, I, like I said, I am an atheist. I do not believe, I cannot get to the point where I believe in a God, but I can certainly respect the thinking and the faith that goes into it. I can't make that leap of faith that that religious people can make, but I can respect it and I can try and understand it better than I do. Um, morality, right and wrong, uh, imagination, creativity, um, all of these things are non-scientific and we should value them every bit as much as we value the scientific method, such as it is or isn't really a method. It's just a bunch of people trying to pretend there's a method, but it's, it's a very flawed endeavor full of human foibles that, and it also science itself depends on very unscientific things. You've heard me say this before science, you invent, you, you come up with a new scientific idea that is actually quite plausible. And the first thing you're going to be met with is a bunch of harumphers telling you how full of shit you are and that's, that you can't possibly be right. And they'll be like, rrr, 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 of course you're wrong. This is all crap. I mean, you only have to look at, uh, at, at professor Higgs to realize, you know, that, you know, what it's like to be ridiculed for most of your scientific life, only then later to be found out to be, to be right. So, you know, it's based on very human problems and we depend on things like creativity. Do you honestly, can you fully appreciate what Einstein went through when he made the leap that, wait a minute, the speed of light is fixed and it's time that is relative to everything that, and relative to emotion. What kind of creativity would have to make that leap? What, what do you have in here that lets you make that leap? It, and science doesn't progress without that kind of quality, without an imagination, without the creativity to take what you've learned, to take the scientific method and use human creativity to make something, to, to make it grow. So science depends on things that are not scientific. 
And so I'm, I just don't buy it. I don't buy this crap that science is all there is. It's just too narrow. And to be belligerent about it, because it's easy to say, well, science is so great because we've done all these things right, and if you don't believe it, you're just a moron, is the wrong, wrong approach to take. And it never, it's never, ever made the situation better. No one's been called stupid or a moron and then gone back and go, hmm, you know what? I like what Richard Dawkins said. He's actually right. You know, what they're saying is they hate the motherfucker and he wanted that, you know, he's, he's, he's an asshole. That's what they're saying. So what good has he done? He's made you feel better because you like him and you follow him and you'll read everything he does. And you're like, yeah, Richard man own the, own the, the religious people. I think that's a wrong way to go about it. Okay. So whew, I've got the vapors now. You guys have given me the vapors. This is a topic I've thought a lot about. Um, will science prove the probability of God? No, it won't. It won't. It is not a scientific question. The, the, uh, it, the, but the definition of God is that it is outside of nature. And if it's outside of nature, science has nothing to say. And, and if you'll think about it, science is getting scarily non-scientific these days with this idea of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics or these bubble universes or these multiverses. You know, all of this stuff is getting scarily non-scientific because there's no way to prove any of this stuff. We're just saying things because the math works out. So are we all Plato? Do we think that mathematics is reality? Because if so, then all of these things are true. But, you know, or, or do we want to see an experiment that is devised that can be shown with observations that every decision we make branches off into another universe? That, to me, would be science. But to say that that's what happened, or it seems like a good idea, which is what Sean Carroll says, then that, to me, is not very scientific. It's not a scientific statement. So be careful. Just be careful. Um, so anyway... Um, Science is part of philosophy. Uh, <laughs> Hans, dude, I, I'm, I, I really think I'm, I, I haven't looked at the viewership, but I'll bet, I bet it's plummeted. It's probably just gone way down. Oh, there's 56 of you here. Well, you've stuck around. I will stop um, ranting. Um, I want to read, I want to give more concrete examples of the books I've read and why I think they're misleading or, or at least dishonest. And I think, you know, look, I get it. Christopher Hitchens was a very smart, is, was a very smart man. Uh, and all of these guys are, and they have good points. And I, I read some of their points resonate with me. Um, I just feel like it's, it's coming from a place of, um, all or nothing right? Science is all there is. And if you think of anything else as being true, then you're an idiot. And that's certainly the way Richard Dawkins approaches the subject. You know, you're just a moron. And, you know, I, li I like Bill Maher. I watched the Bill Maher show, or at least I used to when I had HBO. I can't afford it anymore. But when I was watching Bill Maher every week, and, one, you know, he'd occasionally have Richard Dawkins on. And he, the last interview they had with, with him, and he, they were talking about religion. Of course, we all know what Bill Maher thinks of religion. I actually came away a little bit angry and I actually agreed with 90% of what they said, but it was the way they said it that actually made me angry. I, I, I just like, why are you guys doing this? You know, I was like, it's like, they just want to be like Donald Trump only on the left. They just want to make people react. They just want to say things that make you mad or that make other people mad or that make themselves feel good or their, their fanboys to feel good. And, um, it just makes the situation so much worse. We're already so tribal. We're already so insular in our thinking that if you're outside of our little group, then you just suck. And, you know, there's no intermingling anymore. There's no, uh, you know, uh, like, for example, I don't feel like I have a place. You know, I don't feel like I have a real proper community where I can be a lover of science and appreciate the wonder of the universe through the eyes of science. And, also really value the ideas that of, of non-scientific concepts and, and those in religion. I am not going to sit here and be a, 
a uh, defender of, of Catholics. <laughs> they have a lot to answer for, right? That church has got a lot of problems. I am not going to sit here and say they are without guilt in, in so many ways. In fact, it's gotten so bad that my wife, who is a devout Catholic, has actually left the church in terms of going to Mass because of this priest scandal thing. She can't reconcile the church leadership as the church as it is today with what the church has always taught and what she believes in the church uh, doctrine. So she's actually kind of left the church a little bit uh, in the sense that she still believes in what the Catholics believe in, but she, she's lost faith in the church itself. And so um, I'm not going to defend what they've done. They've got a history that we all know about. And of course, anybody who tries to is also being disingenuous. But they also have a lot of contributions. The first person, it was, it was, there was a friar, and I forgot his name now because I'm old, uh, the, who first came up with the idea before, I think, um, uh, Fred Hoyle did of an expanding universe. Uh, not Fred Hoyle. He called it the Big Bang. But uh, before, it, I think it was in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, uh, this friar was one of the first to come up with this idea of the Big Bang. And of course, we all know Newton was was a big contributor, and there have been there have been uh, you know friars and priests and monks all throughout the history who have contributed scientific knowledge, very valuable scientific knowledge uh, for humanity. So they've got they've got we've got to acknowledge that, right? We just can't ignore it, and we got to be careful of our myths, like the Galileo myth and and other things about how that whole thing transpired. Eh, maybe there's a little bit more to the story, right? So. Okay. Oh, wow. It's okay. It's time to go. Um, I don't know. Yes. Thank you. It was, uh, Lemaitre. Am I, am I saying it right? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, sir, sir, tall Paul. <laughs> um, yes, that's who it was. Uh, that's the one. And Simon, you did it also. So yes, thank you. Um, so there we go. Um, Thank you. And Galaxia, you said it also before I did. So you guys, yeah, you guys know more about this crap than I do. So good for you guys. I'm just sitting here rambling. Um, and Hans Milling, it's all about survival. In the old days, belonging to a group secured your survival. That's why people worship famous people like Elon Musk, because nobody wants to be in a bad standing with the king. <laughs> it's true. I mean, there was a, there's definite survival advantages to being in a group. And human beings, I mean, anybody who's... In America, I don't know about you guys in Europe, I, don't, I haven't heard about any of these protests, but I certainly have heard about them here, that people are protesting being under lockdown. They would rather they would rather be out and about and risk the virus than risk all the rest of us for getting the virus than they would rather stay at home because staying at home and being separated is very hard for human beings to do. So we have these protests where people just want to leave and they want to do what they want to do and take their own chances and and and. And the myth there is that they're only affecting themselves, right? The myth there is that, well, I don't care if I get it. If it's my time, it's my time. Uh, well, maybe not so much. I don't personally want to get it either. And now you're endangering me uh, because what if I, you know, uh, uh, accidentally catch it from you, right? I mean, did you intend, for, are you passing judgment on whether I can get it or not get it? So there's, there's this selfishness there that is a little bit alarming, but you know, we've got these protests. They don't want to. They don't want to be told what to do, and they don't want to be told to be locked down. And so there's these protests here uh, where people are just doing what they want to do anyway. Um, and it's only going to get worse. And so um, it is. You know, there is this sort of herd mentality where we don't want to be cooped up. We don't want to be by ourselves. Being in a group is very, 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 very important to human beings. So you're right, Hans. That's a good point. <sighs> okay, so. Let me read what Varun Vega says. Vanga says, there's an analogy of science. When people try to force a religion onto some group of people, like Europe and Africa, there is science on religion. Let them believe in what they want to believe. Yes, well, I mean, that's, that's certainly true. And Neil Yu is, uh, Tony, what do you think we lost when they burned the ancient library of Alexandria? Oh, my God, who can calculate that? What a lot. All of this knowledge had been stored in a library uh, that we don't even know what was all the accumulated knowledge from the Egyptians uh, and the times and the, and the centuries and the millennia before had been gathered in one spot and burned uh, to the ground. I think it was in Cleopatra's time, but I don't know for sure. It would have been right close to the, the time of the uh, new millennia, the, you know, going from BC to 
BCE uh, to the uh, common era. And I don't, I think it was around that switching period. I don't think Christ was alive then. It might have been before him or just after him. I can't remember. But yeah, I mean, the the amount of knowledge that would have been lost in Alexandria is incalculable. You know, it would be probably equivalent to the entire internet being wiped out. That's basically all of our knowledge is stored on the internet now. And so if it had somehow all been erased, it would be a, an equivalent thing to that. So yeah, it was it was quite a loss, and and who knows how far that set us back, right? Uh, we had we had gained this knowledge, and it wasn't until say three or four hundred years later when people started to apply some of these principles to regain that knowledge that we had. Um, uh, religion doesn't destroy everything, Tuba Pep. It doesn't. I mean, that's just a wrong. You're just wrong <laughs> when you say that. It's it's. That's just not a true statement. Um, so let's see. From the topic astronomy, though, you should make a separate channel for philosophy. <laughs> Perhaps, um, Hans. I, 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 the, the topic. This, this sort of brought up. Um, this brought up the, you know, this discussion with Galileo and science denialism, uh, and lack of trust in science. And then this, whenever someone brings up uh, the science artistic people, the scientism uh, in the world, I get a little bit angry because I'm, I'm, I'm upset about how that is, is ruining things. And I do believe it is. Um, it's wrong because religion doesn't ruin everything. How can any one thing ru ruin everything? What exactly does that even mean, Tula Pip? I mean, science rules that ruins everything? It doesn't. <laughs> I mean, I'm still here. My 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 room is still here. My my the, my my property. Everything is still. What does it ruin? And what does it even mean to say it ruins stuff? You know, what is it taking away from your quality of life, personally? What is it taking away from all of our quality of life collectively? I mean, it doesn't ruin everything. Science doesn't make everything great. That's also a wrong statement. Okay, so don't. What does that even mean that it ruins everything? It's wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> Giordano Bruno, he proposed that the stars were distant suns surrounded by their own planets, and he raised the possibility that these planets might foster life of their own. Yes. Um, I prize human liberty and freedom, but I'm staying on lockdown. Just saying. Yeah, you know, I'm just, I don't want to get it. And if I'm going to be around other people, I'm probably going to get it. So, you know, it's on me, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suddenly decide, oh, well, I don't care if I get it now. I'm going to go out and just endanger others. I actually have a higher moral code than that. What I do affects other people. And I actually realize that. So I'm going to act accordingly. You know, I realize that, well, gosh, I may not be, I may be willing to take the risk of getting this virus, but others might not be. And perhaps just maybe I should think about them a little bit. I mean, this 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 level of morality that we all have is it's varying depending on who you are. Um, many people are of the of the opinion that it's totally fine. This this pandemic, you know what? It's a pandemic. You're going to have a certain amount of collateral damage. Deal with it. And I'm not going to even bother to minimize it. Or should I maybe work at minimizing it and do my part to perhaps minimize the number of deaths that occur? Well, that is a very personal question that you must answer yourself. And many of us are choosing to answer it in the way of it's a risk I think we should all take. And even though I affect my actions affect you, I'm going to do it anyway. That's just the way human beings are. So we have to accept that. I have to plan accordingly. I have to know that if I do go out, which I haven't really, I haven't left my property more than a handful of times in the past few months for this very reason. And, and sadly, you know, poor Charlotte, she goes out and does all the shopping and does all the, the stuff for us because she doesn't, I'm older than her and she doesn't want me to be at risk for it. So, you know, we make these sacrifices. So it's all, it's all something you have to ask yourself, you know, what, yes, you're take you're willing to accept the risk of catching the coronavirus, but you're not the only one in the world. And so do you acknowledge that? Or do you just behave as if you're the only one in the world? You know, and, and, and surprisingly, a lot of the people who are behaving this way would consider themselves to be religious people. So 
in you know are, is are they acting this way because of their religion? I would argue no. Their religion would probably tell them not to, uh, and to be more conscious of those who are less fortunate than them, and to perhaps protect those who are the weakest among us. Um, and yet, there are other factors at work here, right? There's political factors, economic factors, all these other things that would cause that person who would otherwise might think of others who are more at risk than themselves uh, to go out and endanger them because their own personal livelihood is at stake or their own, you know, their own, th their own survival may be perceived to be threatened and maybe it actually is threatened. And so they would act accordingly on that way. Uh, there's lots of reasons why people would do it. And it's my job to understand that that is out there and act according to my own set of constraints, you know, and what in my own risk tolerance. And so, um, I probably said too much. Anyway, if you've unsubbed to the channel, I understand. Um, I, I, I do have, um, I don't usually talk like this on the channel, so I probably have made a mistake. So I will stop. And um, any thoughts on the coming Crew Dragon launch? Yes, Chris, let's switch, let's switch gears. Um, it's a shame Boeing got set back. Yes, it's very true. Um, Boeing's uh, in trouble as a company. I'm going to talk about this more on tomorrow on my um on my uh, weekly space roundup, which I do uh, live on YouTube and on Twitch on Gibson Pick channel. And um, I think it's great. I'm very excited about it. I think that um, it'll be wonderful, um, you know, to get back into the space business of launching people again. And um, so I'm really excited about this. I may try. So I think it's May 26 is the launch date. Maybe it's the 27th. Anyway, I'm going to actually try and go. I think Kennedy, the Kennedy Space Center, I, the visitor complex, I think opened this week. And, you know, talking about social distancing and whether, you know, it's a good idea to go. I won't go to the Kennedy Space Center, but I say that because, you know, the, the, if Kennedy is open, then they'll probably have launch viewing opportunities uh, to see the launch. I won't, I still won't go there. But I, I do have a boat, and I would take my boat to Mosquito Lagoon, which is just outside of the launch complex, and watch it from there. Um, so I'm considering doing that. Uh, to do that, though, I've got to get my trailer, my boat trailer more uh, work. So I hope to see the launch, but I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I'll definitely watch it online um, as well. I think this is a great time. I think... I think SpaceX as a company is doing all, most of the right things. And um, you know, I'm not going to comment on Elon Musk, but the company of SpaceX is actually quite exciting and invigorating. Boeing, not so much. Um, I'm not quite sure if they're even going to survive the way things are going for them. So anyway, it's the 27th. Okay, thanks, Hans. Uh, so yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely... Um, I'm definitely... Gonna, well, okay, Tuba Pip. So yeah, it... <sighs> I don't, I don't see, okay, I'll give you that it has, it hasn't, I'm just going to take issue with one word. You say that religion has always impeded science, and I'm going to just say, you need to get rid of that word always. It has impeded science, it has slowed things down, made things difficult at times, but it has also progressed science. It has been responsible for adding scientific knowledge to the world. So please acknowledge that too. It hasn't always done it. And so these, these words you're using, always and everything, you know, we need to get away from that. You know, it's not true. Um, it is, yes, it has impeded some things. It has made things more difficult. It has been an obstacle at times. And it has ruined some things in the world for sure. Anybody who has followed this pre-scandal can say that is probably a very ruinous thing to have been doing. That is behavior that is no one can justify. Certainly the Inquisitions and all of this stuff that we know from, from history that, this, that has happened. None of this can be justified morally. So, um, but always and everything, let's just maybe not do that, okay? Um, so let's see. Uh, all right. So there's a SETI event happening in 20 minutes. I'm going to get off. Thank you, Andrew Planet, uh, for letting people know. Um, uh, okay. So I think I will stop now. It is already 15 minutes past my time. Whew. Okay.
Well, everyone, I want to thank you all so much for watching. And as always, oh, Brian, by the way, you probably got all of this is streaming on your channel. <laughs> you might want to edit out the last 30 minutes of what I just did <laughs> for your own channel. So, because this is also streaming on his. All right. Okay, guys, I'll be back tomorrow night for the weekly space roundup, uh, 8, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Also, um, uh, on uh, twitch.com uh, slash or twitch.tv slash Gibson Picks. I'll be on the Clear Skies Network as well tomorrow night with the weekly space roundup. So join me there and I'll talk more about the SpaceX flight and other things. So on behalf of Brian Keating, um, thank you all so much for watching. And as always, keep looking up.